All right, you guys can grab a seat. And do me a favor, for one more time in this series, would you put your hands together and welcome everyone that's joining us online later in the week. Show them some love. Thanks for watching. If you are anywhere in the Bay Area and you're watching this, we would love to have you here in the house. Uh, we don't bite. We don't bite, right? We don't bite. We'd love to have you come and hang out with us. No matter where you are, though, let us know how we can serve you or pray for you. Hey, before we jump in today, was last Sunday fun or what? Last Sunday was our 800th Sunday in the history of our church, and we, uh, we celebrated and we had some fun. And I was thinking back this week, I was kind of reminiscing that our church has met in some unique places. Our church began in a daycare that we affectionately called the Stinky Daycare because they would shut the air conditioner off on the weekends. And so by the time we rolled in on Sunday morning, it smelled like, let's just say it smelled like a daycare in the summer without the air conditioning on, amen? We, we met in, in the Stinky Daycare, we met in an elementary school. We actually got kicked out of the elementary school. We did a, uh, did a series on sex and relationships, and they didn't like that. It's like, how do you think you all got here? I don't know. Um, it was a joke. Thank you. Appreciate that. So uh, we got kicked out of the elementary school. We met in uh, two different middle schools. We've met here in this warehouse space that we renovated. And no matter where we've met, though, as we have been faithful together, as, as we have gathered that God has shown up and God has changed lives and God has, yeah, yeah, ministry has happened and that's been fun to be, to be a part of. And thank you guys for going on the ride over the last uh, 800 Sundays. So we have been talking about fun in this collection of talks that we're wrapping up today called Make It Fun. Turn to someone next to you and say, make it fun. Make it fun. There's like a fun section right here, let me tell you. There's some, there's some fun going on. Yeah, so, so how many of you would like to at least keep your life, or for some of you, depending on your situation, would like to make your life, but how many of you would like to make your life more fun? Anyone out there would like a little more fun in your life? That's what this series has been about. It's about adding joy to your journey, and I know someone's at least right now thinking to yourself, like, Pastor Bryant, I just kind of walked into all this. I'm new, or maybe I missed a few Sundays, but this doesn't seem very spiritual, yo. Like, like <laughs> Did you run out of things to talk about? Like, th is this actually in the Bible? And listen, I, I get it. The, when we talk about, like, the most fun place on earth, everyone thinks of what? Disney, right? Yeah, Disney is the happiest place on earth. No one said church, right? When, when, when you say, what's the happiest place on earth? No one goes, oh, church, right? And, and we own that reputation, but I think that breaks the heart of God. Because this is actually in the Bible. This is King Solomon and all of his wisdom thousands of years ago. He says this. He says, so I recommend, like I'm recommending, uh, have fun. Like this is in the Bible. This isn't made up. Because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat and to drink and to enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work that God gives them under the sun. This passage has so many layers to it. I mean, on the surface, it seems very simple, maybe even superficial, but I'm telling you that there's so many layers to this because what this verse is telling us is that fun is not a denial of work. Fun is not somehow a denial of work. Fun is not some kind of like in the cloud, your head in the clouds mentality that thinks that everything is fine in life, so let's just goof off and have fun. That's, that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is actually saying that life is hard, and that life is difficult, and there is a tension that we live with in this world, amen? So what Solomon is saying is because life is hard, because there is tension, because there is hard work, I recommend you figure out how to do what? How to have some fun along the way, because otherwise all you're going to have is the hard work and the tension and the bad stuff, right? So Solomon's like, hey, here's my wisdom and all this. Figure out to have some fun along the way. Add some joy to the journey. In fact, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, God actually worked this as a, as a rhythm, as a pattern into the Old Testament. When you go back and study the Old Testament law, God actually commands his people, the people of Israel, God commands them to have parties. <laughs> Some of you are like, where was this when I was growing up? No one taught me about this part of the Bible. <laughs> this is crazy. Where is this, in Leviticus somewhere? I don't know. Yeah, God actually worked in these national celebrations, these parties, into the fabric of, uh, of the, the nation. There's seven of these. I won't go through all of them. Maybe you've heard of Passover. Maybe you've heard of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the, 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 the Feast of Trumpets or, or Tabernacles. My, my favorite was the Feast of Tabernacles because everyone went camping. 
everyone, during the Feast of Tabernacles, everyone put a, 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 a temporary structure outside of your house, and the whole family, they went and lived in the, the tent during this time. Because every one of these were basically a giant praise party where they were remember, I can't talk, where they were remembering something that God had did for them in the past. And so because of God's faithfulness and the miracles that he had done, he would command them then to celebrate and to party. And, and when these times on the calendar came, when it came time for one of these big giant corporate praise parties, it's not like the priests sent out invitations. It wasn't like they sent out an RSVP like, hey, if you don't have anything else going on, I hope you can make it to Passover. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they didn't send out invitations. This was mandatory. Like this was in the law. It didn't matter how busy you were. It didn't matter whether you felt like partying or not. When the time on the calendar came, guess what you did? You partied, right? God commanded the party, and so you partied. In the opening week of the series, I pulled a verse from one of these, one of these festivals, one of these feasts, and I thought it would be interesting to go back and kind of look at it in its, its broader context. If you have a Bible today, we'll be in Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament, Nehemiah chapter 8. If you have the Bible, the Bible app, it's easy enough to find. Or we'll put the verses up here on the screen, so that may just be the easiest way of all. But Nehemiah 8, if you put that in your notes, that's where we are, Nehemiah chapter 8. If you remember the situation that was going on is the people of Israel were basically living in the ruins of Jerusalem. The, the Babylonians had come in under King Nebuchadnezzar and had taken most of the people hostage in, into to Babylon. There was a remnant of the people that remained there, but there were no city walls. Their houses were burnt out. Everything lay in, in, in ruins. But when the Babylonians fell to the Persians, here's your history lesson for the day. When the Babylonians fell to the Persian Empire, Nehemiah and Ezra, the, the priests, they were allowed to, to go back and to take some people with them and go back and begin to rebuild the city walls around Jerusalem and, and to begin the process of restoring the city. So, so once the final gate is hung and the final stone is put back in place, Ezra, the, the priest, he begins to read from God's word. And they have the, the festival of uh, the festival of tabernacles for the first time in a generation. And that's what we read from in Nehemiah 8 beginning in verse 5. So here's, here's Ezra about to begin the celebration. So Ezra opened the book, that is the, the book of the law. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. As he opened it, the people all stood up. The people all stood up. The people all stood up. There you go. It's this interactive church today. The people all stood up. They stood up. Verse 6, Ezra praised the Lord. Ezra praised the Lord. The great God and all the people lifted their hands. All the people lifted their hands and responded. Help me out. What did they do? They said, amen and amen. I'm preaching. That's how you have church right there. That's interactive church. That's not just me talking and you sit there and fall asleep. No, this is joyful. It's expressive, responsive. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I won't make you do that. <laughs> Verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. It helps when you understand the message. Information without application is a, an abomination. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. They had not heard the words of the law spoken. Most of them couldn't read. So they had not heard, the, they had not heard God's word in a generation. And so here they are, imagine hearing God's word for the first time in a generation. So they're all mourning and weeping over this moment. But Nehemiah says this to him. He says, go, and listen to this, he, the, the pivot. I love this. This is God's word. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. He wanted everyone to know that we're for them, right? Now, now in this situation, before we get to the last verse, don't you think there were some people in the crowd that day that were like, you know what? I'm, I'm not feeling it, Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, no one understands my situation. Yeah, there were probably people that, that day that were like that. There were probably some people there that day that were like, listen, this has been the worst week of my life. No, I'm not doing it. There were probably some people there that week like that. There were probably some people there that day that, that were like, listen, you can't tell me what to do. 
<laughs> I guarantee you there were some people like that, but what did Nehemiah say anyway? He said, go do it anyway. Go, go get yourself some good food and some sweet drinks and have a party because he says this. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. And here's the verse. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Turn to someone next to you and say that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, here's what's so fascinating to me uh, about this is that God is not making a suggestion God's not like asking the people, hey, if you feel like it, want a party. You know? Hey, you know, we're having a little thing at my house later on. Like, you know, if you're not doing anything. <laughs> no, no he, doesn't, he doesn't ask if they're in the mood for it. He doesn't ask if they're busy. What does God just say? He just says, you do it. You do it. You're going to party. He, cho- he tell, told them to, to choose joy. And maybe you've experienced this in your life, that you've gone through, like, the hardest time of your life. You've gone through, like, hell, and and, and you get to, like, rock bottom, and you have a choice to make. Either I can keep slogging my way through this, or you know what? I'm going to choose to put a smile on my face anyway. I'm going to choose to put a song on on my mouth anyway. I'm going to choose to sing and dance. I'm going to choose to lift my head anyway. And even though my, my circumstances haven't changed... The the way I'm responding to it and my experience of it has changed. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is is your strength. He's telling them to choose joy. And here's what I hope you see today is that that God is not asking us to choose between being busy and having fun. God's not asking you to choose between being real and doing hard work and having fun. God's not asking you to choose between fun or work. So many times we think that it's like we've got to choose one or the other. Either we work or we have fun. Either we do the hard stuff now or do it later and have the fun now. Remember that when you were the kids? You tell your kids, like, do your homework now and then have the fun later, right? We have this false, you know, choice that we, we, we think we have to make between doing the hard things and doing the fun things. But what I'm t- saying today is that fun is an attitude and that fun is a state of mind and it's a choice that you and I can make is that we can not only have fun happen to us, but we can choose to bring the fun into whatever environment that we that we go into. We can choose to to serve and have fun. We don't have to make a choice between those two things. Listen to me. We are always looking for more people on our teams here at church. I, I believe that I believe that every single person that attends should be serving. Because here's what I know is that when volunteer teams get fully staffed, that's when the fun begins to happen because they get healthy and they start hitting all cylinders and all of a sudden we're having fun in the parking lot and we're having fun back there in kids and we're having fun up here on stage and the fun just begins to happen. What I'm saying is that we can, we can make things fun that we don't think are fun by having the right attitude. You can make your job, you can make your work fun if you have, you're like, you don't know my boss, bro. <laughs> I don't know what you do at the church all week, but in the real world, I'm serious. You can make your work fun if you choose to go after it with the right attitude. So here's what I want to do today. I have two objectives with everything that I do, every series that I bring you guys, two big objectives, and here they are. The first objective is to bring you, to bring light on some information or to bring light on a topic, to bring light on something that I think you guys should hold up a little bit higher in your life and I should hold up a little bit higher in my life because there's value there. So I want to highlight the, the issue or the subject or the topic, but here's what I also want to do. I want to give you guys some handles to be able to do what God's Word is saying. So today I want to give you three handles of how you can make life more fun, of how you can make relationships more fun. Some of you guys right now are like, honey, I hope you're listening to this. <laughs> like elbowing your spouse, like you better listen to this, make relationships more fun. There are three ways that you can make life work more fun, how you can make church more fun. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give all three of these to you on the front end, so in case you get a text message and you have to leave, or in case you're watching this online and your battery dies, or you've already clicked off to something else, now I want to give them to you up front, and then we'll go back and unpack them. So here's three ways to make your life more fun, and here they are. Write these down. The first one is this, generosity on your face. Second one is levity in your heart. And the third one is praise in your mouth. Generosity on your face, levity in your heart, we'll explain that in a minute, and then praise in your mouth. No matter who you are or what your circumstance is right now, if we would apply these three things to our life, you would bring fun into the situation instead of waiting for the fun to happen to you. So if you're ready to dive into these, say, let's go. Good enough. (laughs) So here's number one, generosity on your face. How many of you have ever had a parent growing up that told you to wipe that look off your face? Hands in the air. <laughs> How many of you ever had a parent when you were young look at you and say, well, I hope your face doesn't you know, freeze like that, sweetheart? 
You ever had that happen? Uh, what are our parents trying to communicate to us in an early age? That with your face, you're communicating things before you even open your mouth. And that's so true. That, that before you ever open your mouth, you communicate so much to the world just by what your face is giving off. My, uh, my uh, youngest daughter, Ella, one time we had gone to the beach. This was when she was, she was maybe around two, two and a half years old. She was still pretty young. And we had gone to the beach, and she was sitting up on the shore, and she was eating her knack. That's how she said snack at the time, okay? She, she was eating her knack, and so she was up on the shore eating her knack. And, and I don't know if I didn't pack a knack for myself or I'd already eaten my knack, but probably the latter. I'd probably already eaten my knack. And so, so I reach over into her bag to get some of hers, and I, I took out like a pretzel or a Cheez-It or something, and, and I put it in my mouth, and Cheryl captured the moment. This is the look that she gave me. Now, now, leave that up there just for, for, for a second, because Ella is my child that wears her emotions on her sleeve. Sophie is my daughter who's a little bit more stoic. Ella, you always know what's going on by the look on her face. And so, so I take a pretzel or, or, or a, a Cheez-It or something out of her knack bag right there, and, and she gives me this look, and instantly I knew it was on her mind. I didn't have to ask her. I didn't have to, like, you know, guess. No, instantly I knew what she felt. She gave me this look, and she goes, you made my knack salty. I, I, I guess she thought the salt water on my hand somehow was making her, I, I, I don't know. But that's the, that's the look that she gave us. And isn't this, isn't this life that this so much of communication begins before we even open our mouths? That we are talking and communicating to the world around us just by the the look and the expression on our face. So if we're going to make it fun, it has to start where? Come on, come on. If you're going to make it fun, where's it got to start? On your face. Turn to someone next to you and say, check your face. Check your face. Check your face. I was born that way. <laughs> but here's, here's why I say that. We get what we give. I was talking to a, a friend recently who took his, I don't want to call her elderly, but let's just call her elderly. She wouldn't appreciate that, but I'm just going to, okay. So, so my, my, my friend's taken uh, his elderly mother to the store when, when she was uh, here recently, and <laughs> they, uh, they, they get done shopping, and then they walk out of the store, and the mom is saying to the son, I'm never going back in that place again, and, and she's complaining about her feet and about the prices and the crowds, and, and, and finally she says, and did you see the look that that lady gave me that works there? Did you see the look she gave me? And the son says to his mom, Mom, listen, she didn't give you anything. She didn't give you anything. She simply gave you back what you've been given the moment you walked in there, right? And I'm like, I would never tell my mom that. You are crazy. But I've told you before what it's like to be up here speaking to you guys. And again, no one here today is this way, but I told you last week about the, you know, about the, the RBF, right? The, the RBF, Resting Believer's Face. That's what it stands for. Some of you, yeah. So, so when pastors and I get together and we kind of banter and, and talk shop, we always somehow manage to talk about this subject, that, that it is so difficult sometimes to preach because of people's faces. And again, no one here today, you guys are lovely. Okay. <laughs> but but it, it, is, it is difficult sometimes. I, I, there are some faces sometimes that you'll be up here trying to, to preach your guts out and bring God's word. And, and, and there are times that you look at their face and you're like, you know what? I just need to sit down right now. <laughs> like, I, I just need to quit and go home and forget about this. It, it will literally make you go crazy, the conversation you have in your head while you're trying to talk at the same time. It's a weird thing. It's like an outer body experience. All because of someone's face. It literally affects so, so what, what we talk about is, is, is we talk about the faces, right? And, and, and so we talk about the people that have the face. You know what the face is? The face of the person that's like, oh, yeah, like the, the person you can tell they're into it and the person that's, that, that you can tell they're in, intent and they're, and they're into it and, and they're not like, right? They're, they're not like that. It's, it's, it's the face that's engaged. And, and we talk about how helpful that is in, in doing something like, like speaking. And it's such a simple but yet profound concept that our physiology affects our feelings. Throughout the Old Testament, God gives us commands to do things physically. He says to, to raise your hands. He says to lift your voice. He says to clap your hands. He says to dance. He says to stand or to kneel or to bow. And, and, and all of these physical commands that, that God gives us. And I, I realize that in the Old Testament, these are all 
all for worship, that God desires to be worshipped, and so he's letting his people know this, this is how I want to be worshipped. But I also believe that, that the God who, who made us and created us also knew how he made us and made our DNA and made our wiring, and he knew that, that when you activate your physiology, it affects your feelings. It affects the way that you experience something. Like, like I know some people that are really, really good Christians, and they know the Bible better than I do, but I would not want to go to church with them. <laughs> I'm just being serious, and I wouldn't want to be pastored by them either. Because it's all up here. It's all intellect. It's all head knowledge. And you hang out with them for a little bit. And it's like, you just want to like tap them on the, hello. Like you just want to like tap them on the head and be like, is there anyone real inside there? Because it's just, right? It's just, it's stonewall. There's just no expression, no nothing. It's like, you certainly have the joy of the Lord in you. Right? And, and it's, it, and I, listen, I, I'm making fun, and I know God wires everyone differently, and some people are more outgoing, and some people are more emotive, but listen to me, please. Don't forsake a blessing just because you're comfortable. Don't forsake a blessing just because you're comfortable in the way that, that you feel most comfortable. Because here's what I know. If you will sing, and you will clap, and you will lift your hands, and, and you will do some of the things that the Bible talks about, not only will heaven receive honor and God be praised, but it will change your experience. You will get more out of worship. You will get more out of church. You will get more out of the experience because your physiology, it affects your feelings. The way that you physically respond to something, it changes the way you experience it. When I was a little kid growing up, they taught us a song in Sunday school that went like this. <laughs> If you want joy, you must sing for it. If you want joy, you must sing for it. If you want joy, you must sing for it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And then, second verse, if you want joy, you must clap for it. Everyone now, if you want joy, you must clap for it. If you want joy, you must clap for it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, okay, now. <laughs> you snorted that's awesome hey that's awesome that was that was the response i was going for but here this is what's so crazy about that though is adults would teach that to kids some of you know where i'm going with this as an adult we would teach that to a child that when you activate your physiology, it does something to your feelings. It does something to your emotions. We will tell our kids to wipe that look off their face. But are we willing as adults to take our own medicine? Listen to me. If you want to make it fun, then tell your face. Feelings follow actions. And you talk about one of the easiest ways we can make this message practical. Just start smiling more. Like, just wherever you go, just make it a habit in your life just to remind yourself, hey, it's time to smile. <laughs> Set a reminder on your phone. I don't care, but do something, right? Because whatever you give is what you're going to what you're gonna get back. All right, that's number one. Number two is this, levity in your heart. Levity in your heart. You want to make life more fun? You need to have some levity in your heart. Levity goes back to a Latin word for lightness. For lightness, for something being light. Turn to someone next to you and say, lighten up, bro. <laughs> lighten up. Because nothing good ever happens from being heavy. Nothing good ever happens from being heavy. Jesus warned us about this. In, in Luke 21, verse 34, he says this. He says, be careful or your hearts will become what? They'll be weighed down with carousing. Some translations say wasteful living. Carousing. Those teenagers these days, carousing. So don't let your heart be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, or, oh, oh, this is interesting, the anxieties of life. That day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Jesus understands. And so he, he says, be careful. Don't let life become so weighty that it closes in on you like a trap. Does anyone want to come up here and testify how weighty life has been over the last 18 months? Life has been a little bit weighty, amen? What does Jesus say, though? Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and what? Heavy what? Heavy, heavy burdened. Heavy burdened. Come to me. Learn from me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, because it is easy. It is 
It is light. Jesus doesn't want to add something to your life that makes you heavier. Jesus is not something that makes your life heavier. Jesus is something that makes your life lighter. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's, that's why Jesus came. Because here's the truth. When you're way down, you're no fun to be around. When you're way down, you are no fun to be around. You ever been around someone that was always just weighed down with stuff? Like, they're just like a joy to be around, right? They always are weighed down. Eeyore, right? They just always something. Like, you spend five minutes with them, and you want to go take a shower because it's just like, oh, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know some people like that? And, 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 and listen, I, your husband, your wife, your parents, your, listen, people can only stand so much of being around that kind of person. And so if that's you, if you recognize that about yourself, you're always just so weighty. Maybe the reason no one wants to be in your airspace is because you're just so heavy to be around. And that's not why Jesus came. And that's why we need to lighten up. We need some levity in our hearts. You want to make it fun? Then lighten up. I'm going to say lighten up. Here's, here, maybe this will paint a picture for you. And, and I tried really hard to, to maybe capture, to, to capture this. So, so let me think about it this way. We, we as followers of Jesus, we, we say we want to be like God. Every single person that's a follower of Jesus, they, 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 that's like one of the things, right? I want to be like God. I wanna be, we sing songs about that. I want to be more like you, right? And I think in our hearts we mean that, but we also don't really. And let me tell you why I don't think we really mean that. Because if we really wanted to be more like God, we would be having a whole heck of a lot more fun than we do. We, you know what we want? We, we want safety and cultural respectability. We're, we're not so much the, the image bearers of the creator trying to imitate and mimic him. I, I think, this is my personal opinion now, I, I think a dolphin playing in the surf. I think an eagle in a dive. I think a mangy old mutt in the back of a truck with his tongue wagging around like a flag in the wind. I think that more wholly paints a picture of who the creator is than many of our theologians and influencers and thinkers that we have in the church today. I think about how we live our daily lives. How do we parent? Don't do this. Don't do that. Hey, get off that couch. No gluten in this house. Hey, don't do that. Don't touch that. Put that down. You could get hurt. It's almost as if we think God is an infinite list of negatives. And absolutely, is God 100% righteousness? Yes, he is the rawest form of righteousness we can fathom. But many of us believe that because of that, God is some kind of like, he's some kind of like cosmic stress out. That because God is so holy and so righteous and we're so not, that that's some kind of like, like stressor for us. But how does God parent? <laughs> When God first created Adam and Eve, he gave them one rule. One rule. Hey, don't touch the tree. By the way, I'm giving you an entire planet. <laughs> an entire planet is yours with animals to explore and name and tame and wild and beautiful places to explore that are not safe all the time, but they sure are fun to go and see and experience. God gave them one rule. God gave us things for our comfort and enjoyment. We squandered all of that in sin. So what did God do? He sent his son to come and save. And now we have two rules. Love God and love others. That's how God parents. Love God and love others. Oh, and all, by the way, uh, enough grace that when you blow it, here's the grace you need for that. And oh, by the way, here's a door from the grave to eternal life. If we really believe that as followers of Jesus, we would have a whole lot more levity in our hearts. We would be a whole lot lighter, amen, if we truly believe that. I mean, stop and think about it. God wove secrets into creation that have teased us for centuries. Uh, the mysteries of electricity, right? The mysteries of electricity and, and flight and, and chocolate, God buried gold down deep that we'd have to dig for, but scattered sand everywhere, which, oh, by the way, has fueled the technology that makes our lives so enjoyable today. God made things simple and funny. God put skin bags full of milk underneath cows. Yeah, 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 go up, go up to the skin bag full of milk and give that thing a squeeze, right? And then, come on, you give that thing a squeeze, and then with what comes out of it, separate the cream from the milk. And then you mix in some sugar from cane grass. Cane grass, really? 
cane grass. She mixed in some sugar from some cane grass and some vanilla bean from distant, far away lands. And you blend it together and you put it in some icy water so cold that the molecules actually begin to expand and become a solid. And you stir it and you taste it and you praise Jesus. We, we say, Johnny, that's enough ice cream. And God says, but have you tried the hot fudge? God put fruit down low that we could reach it and grab it. He made the back of a horse to be flat and strong, obviously for a reason. God hid the joys of, of, of V8 muscle cars behind the, the, the mysteries of fossil fuel and, and, and steel and glass without any creative help at all. Come on. Without any creative help at all, God made both peanuts and birds with big, juicy, plump breasts. You take the peanut and you get the oil out of the peanut and then you slice up the chicken breasts. You dredge it through the remains of its offspring. And then you put that into the hot boiling peanut oil and you fry it until it's golden brown. Then you put some salt from the sea on it. We say that'll kill you. God says it's called Chick-fil-A. Take and eat. (laughs) Except on Sundays. I mean, we we saw you with me. We say that we want to be like God, but but does your does your sunshine warm the faces of the people around you? Does your rain make your environment that you're in greener? Did you end your day with anything even remotely like a sunset? No, you don't. Do you begin your day with anything as glorious as a sunrise? Heck no. We say we want to be like, more like God. Amen. Well, here's how you'd be more like God. Enjoy moonlight strolls. Enjoy cute babies. Enjoy what creates the cute babies. And hold on to one lover until you're both aged like fine wine. I I saw this quote the other day and I thought that was absolutely amazing. That holiness is nothing like a building code. Holiness is 80-year-old hands crafting an apple pie for others again. Listen to me, if you're a follower of Jesus, then, then live your joy, be your joy, speak your joy, sing your joy, tuck your joy down into your bones until it spills over onto the lives of the people around you. If you want to have more fun, then lighten up. Lighten up. Skin bags underneath the cow, okay? Lighten up. Have some ice cream. Turn to someone next to you and say, have some ice cream. Have some ice cream. Unless you're lact- lactose intolerant, my apologies. So generosity on your face, levity in your heart, and thirdly is this, and we'll wrap it up with this. Praise in your mouth. Praise in your mouth. Now, now this is a little technical, and no one really needs to know the difference, but praise and worship are actually two different things. We, we, it's technical, and we blend the two together in every worship experience that we do, but, but praise is actually, in the Bible, it's the, the highly spirited, joyful, and uninhibited stuff. It's literally the loud noise. God, there you go. God, God asks all creation to praise him. Psalm 100 says this. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, everyone on the earth. Serve the Lord with sadness. No, no, what does it say? Gladness. With gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Make it fun. Come to him with songs of joy. Hear what I'm about to say to you. The tougher the days, the louder the praise. The tougher the days, the louder the praise. The tougher the days, the louder our praise needs to be. Because let me tell you what I believe about the days we're living in. And I'm not trying to get all like, oh, it's the end of time. Well, yeah, it's been the end of time ever since Jesus left, bro. Like, we're, It's been going on for 2,000 years. It ain't nothing new. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that for the days that we're living in right now that we need more praise. Not only corporately as a church body, but individually as the church in our neighborhoods and communities and the places that we work. We, we need to have more praise going on in our lives to combat and to counteract all of the negative garbage that we are having to live with on a daily basis. And that's why I'm submitting this to you, that one of the most powerful things that you and I can do, if you want to make it fun, you want to make everything you do more fun, one of the most powerful things you can do is realize that praise doesn't have to end when you leave church. That the praises of God can be on your lips 24-7. That every single day you can wake up and praise God for this day and, and praise God for your mercies that are new every morning and praise God for the person that figured out how to take a coffee bean and to grind it up and put it in hot water. Praise is about God. Worship is to God. So in Isaiah 61, the prophet says this. He says, the garment 
of praise is for the spirit of heaviness. Some of you need to put on the garment of praise. Some of you feel very heavy right now. You need to put on the, the garment of praise. I think we need to get in the habit of pausing and taking inventory of all the things that we have to be thankful for. Because if we would pause and take inventory of all the things that we had to be thankful for, we'd realize that we could have an attitude of gratitude a lot more than we do. I mean, pr praise God that I've got a job. Praise God I've got kids. Praise God for my life. Praise God I'm not in the hospital today. Praise God that I've got parents. Praise God that, that I've got a roof over my head and food in my belly. Praise God that I've got a church family and, and volunteers and, and leadership here. Pra praise God for, for all the things you can make a, a, a list of, all the things that we take for granted but ultimately come from his hand. And as you begin to make a list of all the things that you can praise him for, you're going to feel that spirit of heaviness begin to lift off your shoulders as you put the garment of praise around. And here's what else I believe. I believe that if you would do this one simple thing, you would raise the value of who you are to the people around you. I think you would raise the value of who you are to the people around you, and this is why I believe that, because when you praise, it magnifies God. When you praise, it makes God bigger, and it makes us and our problems smaller. The more you praise, the bigger God gets, and the smaller we and our problems get. The flip side of that's also true, is that when we don't praise, is that God gets smaller and our problems get bigger. And here's what many of us have experienced. It is as we've gone through difficult times and our praise has not been on our lips, suddenly, instead of being the kind of person that can be depended on by other people, suddenly we're not available to be depended on anymore because we're so wrapped up in our own little world and our own problems that we're not available to the people around us. But here's what praise does. Praise gets the focus off of yourself because it makes God bigger. And it magnifies his faithfulness and his greatness and his awesomeness and how good he's been to you in your life. So if you consider this your church, if you're watching online and you consider this your church, then, then would we do this? Would we not just apply this message to our lives? I hope you apply it to your life. But let's be a unified church. Let's be a unified church and then let's put some smiles on our face and let's go out into the place that we live and the place that we work and the place that we go to school and let's do these three things. Let's be generous with our faces. It costs you nothing and you get back whatever that you give out. Let's, let's add a little levity to our souls, to our hearts. Here's what I believe today. I believe that some marriages are gonna get better because you're gonna lighten up. There, there, there's some husbands, there's some wives right now that you need to receive this. You need to lighten up. And if you would lighten up, your marriage is going to get better. I believe there's some marriages today that are going to be on a different path because you learned to, to lighten up. Let's get some levity in our hearts and let the praises of God always be on our lips. Let's make it fun. Turn to someone next to you and say, let's make it fun. Your, you, your life is a gift from God. And what you choose to do with your life is your gift back to him. Church life is too short not to make it fun. Yeah, there's hard things and there's difficult days and there's things we have to go through, but we can bring the fun with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you that, that you have left this in your word tucked away, that we could stumble across and find this thousands of years later that that Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he says that, that we should make it fun. That, yeah, there's going to be some hard stuff in life, and there's going to be work, and there's going to be struggle, and there's going to be turmoil and challenges, and that's part of living in a fallen world. But, but we can choose joy. We can choose joy. We can choose how we respond to the world around us. Father, I believe there's some people here today that need to make that choice because they have been going through some living hell. And I don't know everyone's circumstance, but I believe that there's some people today that are going through some health things right now that it has been dragging on and dragging on and dragging on, and it has sucked the joy out of your life. Today, I challenge you, I implore you, I encourage you on the authority of God's word, choose joy. Choose joy. In the middle of the pain, sing louder. In the middle of the, the uncertainty, sing louder. In the middle of having any control over the situation, praise him even more. I think some other people that are going through some relational things that you've been battling with marriage issues and, and there's some relationships hanging by a thread and, and, and maybe there's some things out of your control today too. I believe the same thing. 
the middle of the pain and the uncertainty and the middle of the hurt and what they did and they did this and they did that, I encourage you, choose joy. Choose joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and you're going to need some strength. Amen? You're going to need some strength for the days ahead, so choose joy. Make it fun. Make it fun for you. Make it fun for your family. The harder the days, the louder the praise needs to be. Father, may this house be a house of praise. That as the days get dark, as they get light, as they get dark, whatever season we're in, may this be a house of praise. That when people walk in here, they know who we're singing about and they know who is ultimately in control. And his name is Jesus Christ. He came and died for your sins and rose again on the third day to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. Maybe today you walked in and the reason you walked in today is because maybe you've never accepted the gift of salvation that God has offered. He sent his son 2,000 years ago to pay the price for your sins, past, present, and future. It is not up to us to be good enough because we can't be good enough. Maybe the reason you gave up on religion and gave up on church and gave up on God a long time ago is because you, you didn't see a point because you never could be good enough. Maybe no one ever told you that, that that's what grace is for. And that's actually why Jesus came, to forgive you of your past, your present, and even your future. And to set you free from guilt and shame. And to give you new and abundant life, eternal life that we can experience even here and now. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you said yes to Jesus? I want to lead you in a simple prayer. You can pray in your heart and mind. It doesn't have to be out loud, but just in your heart and mind. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, thank you for coming to rescue me with your life, your death, and your resurrection. Forgive me for living such an independent life so far from you. I open my heart and my life to you now. I ask that you come in and be my Lord and my Savior and my forever friend. If you prayed that prayer this morning, it's the most important decision that you could ever make. It's why our church exists. If you would just take your communication card out to the bottom of your service guide there and check the top box halfway down. It says, I took my first step with God today. I accepted Jesus. If you will check that and put that into the offering box on the way out, we'd love to mail you a Bible and a letter, that means, a letter that outlines a little bit more of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Don't leave this service today if you need to make that decision. I believe with all my heart that's why someone came today. is because you needed to give your life to Jesus. And today was the day. And you've had the opportunity. Say yes if that's you today. Father, I thank you for even one person that says yes to you. I believe there's a party going on in heaven for even one person that repents and comes back to, to the Father. It, May we have a celebration in our hearts as we leave today. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus and how you've demonstrated your love for us, that before we even chose you, you chose us. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Everybody said amen. Come on.